There's a chainsaw outside here in my neighborhood, and there's nothing I can do to change it. You would think they'd abstain so this podcast could be good, but there's no way that I can arrange it. Hi, Stan. Hey, Marshall. What's going on? I'm glad to be here for another Draftsman podcast. Woo! <laughs> what do you want to talk about today? We have a subject. Uh, we do. Sketchbooks. We're going to talk about sketchbooks. And it's not, not scribbling, which we talked about a few weeks ago. This is a little different. A little bit different, but specifically sketchbooks. Did you read the, <laughs> uh, the note that we got from somebody about sketching? It was from Sketch Cat who said, I think sketching practice is the most underrated and overlooked thing that young artists and so on. Everyone just wants to do that finished drawing and or painting. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of what prompted this. Yeah, uh, sketching is great. It is. <laughs> we love sketching. Yeah, no, no bias against sketching. <laughs> yeah, I, I love sketching. I, I mean, mo I think honestly, most of the drawings I've done in my life have been sketches. Most of the time I've spent drawing, I've been sketching. It would make sense. I mean, all those life drawings that I did when I was at Watts, like I think those are sketches. I mean, yeah. they're not finished drawings. I mean, sure, I might have, some of them I've sp I spent, you know, two and a half, three hours on. But the, the, those two and a half, three hours, they were not spent like rendering detail. They were spent doing a large picture, very complicated, fast. <laughs> right? Not, I, I couldn't spend a lot of time on anything to like mull over it. Is that the right word? Yeah, yeah. But let's let's start out then with what you mean by sketching because one thing I'm seeing is you're talking about putting in detail, rendering are something other than sketching. How do you define it? Well, it's kind of loose. I don't have a definition. I have a, a an abstract cloud of a, of a blurry idea of what a sketch is to me in my okay. head. Right. Well, I have uh, a definition. Let's hear yours okay. then. At Fullerton Community College, we've got a whole series of classes called Sketching for Animators and Illustrators. And I taught one of them several times. And during that time, tried to work on what does sketching mean? And the best I can do is a sketch is not meant to be the finished piece. It is a means okay. to an end. And even the uh, the English word, Sketch goes back through Dutch, German, uh, all the way back to uh, Greek, Italian, Greek. Uh, and the Greeks, it came from a word that had to do with extemporaneous, which is why you also get the thing about uh, a comedy sketch, that it is uh. not planned. It's an exploration in order to plan something that you'll then later take to finish. So that's the whole thing. It's not meant to be the finished thing. It's meant to be finding the finished thing. Now, I, I want to challenge you a little bit just because that's yeah. fun. Um, be, <laughs> in order to fully understand your definition, which uh -huh. is it's not meant as the finished piece, now mm -hmm. we have to define what is a finished piece. Okay, your turn. <laughs> well, no. I, I, see, that cloudy idea of what a sketch is, that, that's how I said I don't know exactly, is pre precisely because of that. Because sketches so often now are kind of finished pieces. People present them as like, hey, look at this thing I did. Yeah. Carl Kapinski, his sketches, before he never liked to show them because he didn't think people would be interested. And then he started showing them and people loved them more than his finished products. And now like his Instagram is just full of his sketches, which people consider as like a final piece. People would buy that stuff. Yeah. Same with Kim Jong-gi. Kim jong Gi stuff, it's all sketches really, right? I mean, or if it's not, then what what would be considered his sketches? Yeah, that's, that's where <laughs> the definition gets blurry. But yeah. do you know what the word was before people talked about sketches for finished painting? They used to use the term cartoon. A cartoon, <laughs> yes. and it, it was not meant that the cartoon was funny or animated or a comic strip. It meant that it left out a lot, but it lets you know where to put stuff. And then eventually in the 20th yeah. century, late 19th century, the word cartoon took over to mean a finished drawing. Yeah. See, that word has evolved too. And what yeah. does it mean to leave out a lot? You can have a finished piece that intentionally leaves out a lot too. I mean, there's all sorts of fine art now that is meant to be a finished piece that actually doesn't have any sketches. Like some people just like, they'll start their piece 
and then they'll just like throw some paint, right? Like abstract artists, let's just say. And I, I know I'm probably talking about this as if, from the point of view of someone who prefers representational art. They just throw some paint, <laughs> right? My kid could do that. Yeah, and you know, and they make this crappy thing. No. So they they don't plan it. That's my point is they approach it very improvisationally. They don't have like concepts and studies and thumbnail sketches that they did before it. They'll just like they'll they'll approach it very much emotionally. Their painting yeah. is like their emotions. And so it's all about that uh, that uh, process of creating it. And it's like, well, is that a sketch just because they didn't plan it? <laughs> We're sort of coming back to sketching and scribbling being synonymous, but I don't think that's what we want to do. So, maybe we should make a distinction between sketching and scribbling. Uh, scribbling may or may not have to do with process because it may be that you do your finished piece in scribbles deliberately, where sketching implies that you are seeking something. So, that first part of scribbling to discover is sort of sketching. Nicolaides didn't like the term sketching because he felt like it implied something unfinished. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what it does imply, is that I don't mean this to be the finished thing. If it is, okay, then we'll change the definition. But you know, I don't know. I don't know how yeah. much trouble our audience has of understanding what uh, sketching is. Yeah. I don't think it matters. That's why I said it's kind of this cloudy thing. Everybody kind of understands what it is. You know it when you see it. Here's a definition I wrote down. Sketching is roughly doing something with the possibility of moving beyond that rough stage. Okay, sure, cool. That's that's a that's a great idea. Um, but let's not talk about what sketching is. Let's just talk about sketchbooks because you certainly can have more finished pieces in your sketchbook if you want. So who cares what the yes. definition of a sketch is? Now we're talking about devoting a book yes. to this thing. I want to go back to that point that, uh, who was it that you read that comment by? Oh, oh, Sketch Cat. Why do I think sketching is extremely beneficial for learning? Yeah. The biggest reason is because you get to fail fast. I think I've, I've mentioned this before. We have. But, um... And, and by the way, both of those are very important. You have to balance the two. I'm not siding with sketching or with finished drawings. I think that both are extremely important. There's certain things that you have to think about that you have to solve in a finished drawing that you don't have to think about and solve in a sketch. You can get away with a lot more with a sketch. Um, something a little that's a little bit more loose or something that's a little bit more quick. I could show you an example. Do. This is not a sketch. By no sense of the word. <laughs> oh, and to the listeners, I'm, I'm just showing a, a, a highly rendered drawing I did of Yoni from my anatomy class and you could click on the, the in the description, there'll be links. Um, so, if I was sketching this quickly, I would not give nearly as much thought and time to figuring out how do I show in this area the bones of the rib cage popping through, pushing out on the muscles. Yeah. <laughs> right? Of the oblique and the serratus uh, and the lat stretching out. Oh, sorry. I'm away from the mic now. It's okay. It was kind of interesting. In a sketch, you're not going to think about that step. You're going to think about the gesture going through. You might think about the general shape of the rib cage underneath and kind of how you know, the, the, the contour of the muscles on top. But then when you're rendering it, when you're really considering all that detail, now you got to think about like all that really, really, really subtle edge work of every shape. How does that really show? Is this a thin muscle on top of a hard bone? Mm -hmm. you, you don't do that in a sketch, okay? And that's very important. But if you only do these really, really long drawings where you're thinking about such detail for a long time, you never really get to fail fast on certain things that you can fail fast on, like gesture and perspective and proportions. You know, all that stuff, if you, if you do a five minute drawing and you try to get the general proportions of the figure correct, you could do, wait, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to do math. <laughs> in an hour, oh in an hour, you could do twelve 
right? <laughs> Not <laughs> bad. Good. Yes. You're getting yes. better. Woo. All right. <laughs> 60 divided by five. Um, <laughs> you could do 12 drawings instead uh -huh. of maybe one of these in like three days, right? Mm -hmm. And you can, you can fail at proportions much faster that way. Which and why is failing fast important? Is failing leads to to success? Yeah, you you learn quicker when you when you can learn from your failures. That's something we brought up in scribbling to discover. But here's something about sketchbooks specifically that you are bringing up, mm -hmm. which is that there are different types of sketchbooks. Here is a big problem with sketchbooks: is what is this sketchbook for? If it is meant to be a true sketchbook. It means that it will have stuff in there that is embarrassing to show to the family and to other people because it's so undone, it's so unsuccessful. And so my problem in my 20s when I tried to start sketchbooks over and over is that they were not sketchbooks. They ended up being showcase display books where if I did something that wasn't good, I would pull the paper out and then I'd have these gaps in there because it was a bound book. And then you try to do it on loose leaf. And if you do it on loose leaf, it's missing something about the sacredness of everything is here in one book. Binders are a compromise because they allow you to pull out a page without uh, affecting hmm. uh, the whole. But here's the uh. thing though. What happens when you've got three or four purposes for a book? Uh, does it bother you that you're going to have some stuff that's really beautiful and some stuff that you feel like it's your baby pictures, that it was a record of progress? Yes, but also I'm embarrassed about how badly I did that. An attitude toward what the purpose of this book is, is I think a first thing to concern ourselves with. How about you? Well, first of all, the, the, the binder idea. Yeah. I feel like that's not really getting away from this pressure of creating a good piece. Still, you, you, you still need to approach it as, I don't care if I screw up. Mm -hmm. And not because I don't care if I screw up because I can take this paper out and, and, and put a different one in. Right. And then keep only the really good ones. Because you're still then going to try always to make it really good. Yeah. Because you know that if you don't, you're going to have to take that paper, paper out, put a new one in. So, you're saying that if you give that up, You've got an attitude of, I'm okay with the stakes. Yeah. Yes. I, I think a better compromise is having two sketchbooks. Okay. One where you really don't care. This is permission to mess up and go in there to do to actually mess up. Just go in there and do bad drawings, yeah. right? And that'll get you used to actually doing bad drawings in your sketchbook without caring. And then have another one where you actually care. It's your, what did you, did you call it a showcase book? Yeah, a portfolio. Portfolio book, yeah. Yeah, a display book. Display book, yeah. It, it, that, unfortunately, sketchbooks tend to become that, especially they when you do. got a good start on one. You yeah. start, You start one and it's like, oh man, these first three pages are really good. Okay, I got to keep going. <laughs> I can't mess up this sketchbook. And that that is bad. Okay. That goes against the very purpose of a sketchbook. Okay, so we have one room where we do this, one room where we do this, and, and one would be for pure exercises. These are not meant to be appreciated. They are just cheap paper that I am going to do one thing after another after another that can be thrown away. Another may be more like a diary. Is This is personal stuff that I don't want to be seen. And another one is where I'm going to actually try to make these pages something that are, are worth looking at. But we've got a place for each thing and each thing in its place. Yeah. And Aaron Blaze, he did a sketchbook tour video on my channel. Look it up actually, it was a really good video. And a lot of his sketchbooks, he used to take when he's traveling. And so, he'd have a sketchbook and be like, this is when I went to Africa. This is my Africa sketchbook. Yeah. And it'd just be filled with sketches he did in Africa. Yeah. And, and so, that it is kind of like a diary in that sense. It's like a... Yeah, a travel journal. A travel journal. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. yeah. A travel journal. It's great. And he would write notes. So, he would, yeah, he would have like a sketch that he did and then at, I think he said at night or something, he would, he would write in it on the, on the page next to it about what happened that day. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool. Like that, that's like you're, you're not just capturing your, your, your ideas with words but you're also capturing that moment 
that that time when you were standing there in that area, what you were seeing, you captured it um, or not, <laughs> whatever it is. And that that's pretty cool looking back on it because when you open that up, it brings back memories of that day in a way that just trying to remember it without that page, uh, it would be much more difficult. Indeed. Um, and I think he even put like, he would even take like a, like a leaf or a branch or whatever and put it in like that also is like, oh, I remember that's what was on the ground. Like it brings back all this stuff. Um, and so, that's a totally different purpose, right? That's for like memories and, and keep keeping a record of something. And also, it's somebody who is on the level of Aaron Blaze <laughs> yeah. who when a when a student is trying to do that, there can be so much humiliation for all of the failures in there that it can be discouraging. That was my biggest crisis with sketchbooks in my 20s. Then how did you get over it? Let me tell you. Okay, there you go. Because you got to just keep going until you get rid of that fear of messing yeah. up in your sketchbook, right? Yeah, I did not get over it <laughs> until okay. I was in my late 30s. It was the the summer of 1997 that I had had a friend who was taking, he was driving me from here up to Fullerton to teach classes. And we had animation students who were so free and easy with their ability to draw. They would open up their sketchbooks and they would just start putting lines down. And I could teach them anatomy and slow motion stuff, but I just could not open my sketchbook and dare to draw. So, he gave me a pin in the spring of 1997 and said, I think you need this. And it was a bit like that twilight zone where that guy would say, I think you need this and then they'd end up needing it to save their lives. I needed it to not work in pencil for a while, but only to work in pen so that when I put something down, there was a commitment to it like shooting a hole in the bottom of the boat that you must take the island or be taken. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just feel page after page after page of drawings that were terrible and it was so hard to do them because there was a sense that if your family sees this, they are going to think you've lost your talent. They were used to seeing these finished pieces. Yeah. And sure enough, at the July 4th family gathering, people said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because I had my sketch back there and I'd show them and they'd look at it and say, I'll be, I'll be right back. I'm going to get something to drink. And they'd never come back <laughs> because they felt like he's gone crazy. He's just doing all this scribbling stuff. But I had to, as they say, let go of the cup of cold tea so that your hand is free for the cup of hot tea. And it took almost a year before anything came of those sketchbooks that had to do with anything about style or yeah. personal image development. But it only took a few months before the fear of going in there with a pen and making a mess was gone. So, it was in, it was almost at the age of 40 that I even really addressed it because of the pain of choking down so much on finished drawings and not being able to be loose about anything and comparing myself with students who were and recognizing I've got to, as a midlife crisis, get past this carefulness. But it was a conscious choice and it was not without pain. Yeah. And I think that pain is is necessary. <laughs> yeah, we need to go I through that too. pain because that pain is, it means we care, it drives us to get better. Well, that particular pain is not necessary if a person is trained well from the time they're young. <sighs> if they are given permission to have a time where you just start gesturing and you make your gestures worth something, you're actually concentrating on something and then you've got a responsibility, got, you've got a, resp a, a freedom to make a mess and a responsibility to clean it up. And when that dynamic between those two opposite modes is well established early on, there does not have to be pain for that particular instance. There'll be other kinds of pain, of course. You mean specifically but, for that fear uh, of messing up? Yeah. It, should, it can thrash a person who's had years of practice being careful and being competent and being rewarded for it. 
And to have that yanked away is is difficult emotionally, yes. There, there needs to be a little bit of that though. Yeah, there does. Because if there is no fear of messing up at all, then you're just careless completely all the time. And <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and too careless. Even in a sketchbook right. where you're free to make mistakes, you still have to care enough to try to make a good sketch. <laughs> yeah. And you, so, you have to... You have to find the balance. I think, I think a little bit of that pain going a little bit too far of being scared, then trying to loosen up, finding that balance on your own, I think is important. Stan, there is no question that by the time I was in my 40s, I got past that fear. Uh, maybe too much, as you said, is <laughs> there wasn't there wasn't enough. But I filled book after book after book with stuff like this yeah. where I would use ink nice. and just go in there and throw it down and not care. And there was all sorts of terrible stuff that came out of it, but there were some decent things that came out of it too. Yeah. And, uh, and so, I'm glad I did that, but I wish, I wish that I had in my teens known enough or been instructed to separate out the stuff that is pure process, pure exploration, do not judge it yet, judge it later. And the stuff that was uh, display. So, we've defined, I think, uh, two types of sketchbooks. We got that travel journal and then we got that completely free to mess up mm -hmm. sketchbook where we just go there to, to, to explore, right? Those yeah. Are two. So, are there any more? I mean, I could think yes. of, uh, there's a lot of artists I know whose sketchbooks are neither one of those. <laughs> you're, you're right. There's, there are so many different kinds of sketchbooks. So, this might be the first job with a sketchbook is to actually take time, not two minutes, although you may solve it in two minutes, but to take a few days and in conversation uh, with someone who's helping you train as to what the sketchbooks are about. Remember, Heinrich Klei's sketchbook had studies in there. Those were things that were not reproduced typically. Mm -hmm. Uh, but those were for him. Uh, da Vinci's sketchbooks may be some of the most revered in history and lots of studies that he intended nobody to see, lots of ideating. They are actually not so much sketchbooks, they are thinking books thinking books, in which yeah. he sketched lots of ideating. Yeah. Uh, so, there would be the first thing to make a sketchbook successful, we can't have to have something to measure it against. Why am I doing this in the first place? And if they are all to be thrown away, I mean, all of the pages in this sketchbook are to be thrown away except maybe the first one and the last one so that as we go through a series of sketchbooks, we are documenting where we were, that I grew from here to here this month and then from this month to this month grew from here to here. That might be worth keeping. Yeah. So, with the sketchbooks where we um, are exploring and we're not too worried about presenting like a really nice piece, the, I think there's two, two purposes that I still see within those, like two branches off that. One is practice, right? You're just mm -hmm. kind of doing exercises. You you know you're doing quick sketches from some photos, and they're, they're just quick sketches. And you just fill up pages of Loomis heads, whatever it is. So practice, and then the other one is thinking or uh, exploring your own thoughts and ideas. So those two are very different, I think. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and would you separate your sketchbooks from one to the other? Do you think, or or can those two be combined? See, that's the kind of thing that it has to be an individual who decides that for right. themselves because they can be combined. In fact, they can make a very good uh, yin-yang. Uh, mm -hmm. I even at one point, because I was giving a lot of thought to sketchbooks for how to benefit students with this, I even thought, wouldn't it be a great idea? Even though I hate working on both sides of the pages, I know some great artists work on both sides of the pages and part of that shows that they do not deem these precious. They're, they're just exploration. But if you are going to work left side and right side, what if one side is chaos and one side is order? But it didn't work. And it, the reason it didn't work is because sometimes you have periods of time in your life of weeks or months where it's all chaos and you do not want to take the time to refine it because it's going to take you off a roll. And another time you need to refine stuff, but you might say, hey, I don't have much chaos here to refine. So, it's an experiment. The sketchbook itself has to be treated as a sketch mm -hmm. that I'm going to find out within two or three of these what works best for me or doesn't. Yeah. 
So personally, what I've done is I have themes in my sketchbooks. So I'll have like three or four different sketchbooks going on at the same time. One of them is like, like for example, I, I've been teaching anatomy for a while, right? So like one sketchbook is just like where I, I, I do a bunch of like anatomy sketches where I practice anatomical stuff. I'll, I'll prepare for a lesson I'm about to do. Um, I'll just do anatomical drawings in there. And, and yeah. these are sometimes I'm just practicing. Sometimes I'm just, I'm uh, exploring ideas for my lesson. Yeah. Um, so, it's all anatomical. So, that's like a theme. Another one is where I, this is where I work. Like, this is where my, anything goes. Like, it really doesn't matter. This is not to make pretty pictures. It's not, not even always to make pictures. It's sometimes they're diagrams. Sometimes like yeah. I'm, I'm building an easel and I need to draw it out. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's a picture, but it's really just to kind of think through this other thing I'm about to do. Um, they're like just visual notes. You know, the the kind of, we should probably talk about materials here too, is that what if you're doing a sketchbook that is thin paper and you intend to work out a medium that's wet? I decided to devote one book when I yeah. was teaching watercolor, just one book to watercolor because that's it was perfect. thick enough paper to where I could work out the problems on paper that could handle wet medium and yeah. it wouldn't work if I was using a thinner uh, book. So, maybe we should talk now about yeah. the practical aspect of setting up what kind of sketchbooks you use. What do you use by the way? Do you use one kind? Well, I use I use different I, different types of sketchbooks. So, like- Tell us which kind. And, and I think the themes really kind of choose what type of sketchbook you want to use. Like, if you want to explore watercolor sketching, well, you're going to have to get a different sketchbook from than if you're doing- <laughs> like pencil drawings, yeah, right. You're gonna need a thicker paper, um, and so it just makes sense that you 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 combine the two. You think through that. Personally, for my anatomical sketches, I use toned paper. I just I like the look of anatomical like diagram style sketches on toned paper. Uh, it just looks cool. What brand? It's the Strathmore, I think. Let me see. Yeah, the Strathmore has all those toned paper. Yeah. I, it's part of their 400 series, I think. Oh yeah, th this is it. This is what. Um, this might be my one of my older ones, but like, I don't know. Here, nice drawings. So, nice sketches. There. So, so here's like some really old pelvis and torso. Yeah. Torso explorations. And you work on both sides. Oh, and then here I even had like a little skit for Skelly that I never actually ended up using, uh -huh. uh, where he grew grows legs. <laughs> Stan, that's great to see. You know, some these are all from imagination. This is remember what I taught like rib cage and pelvis and how you can like just have those two forms and you can connect them with the spine. And so I start I, I was just practicing inventing those forms. Um and they're pretty messy. You can see how look, I mean look at how messy these are. Well, they kind don't of. look that messy to me, but well, they're, they're, I, I, I do yeah. understand what you're saying. You know, saying. When, when you zoom out, they actually look pretty clean. But when you look closely, it's it's a ballpoint pen, um, and underneath, like the light lines are actually kind of messy. And then I, I went over with a darker line on top. You have certainly done your homework. Um, so yeah, this is I just like this kind of stuff on toned paper. If you're yeah. doing, uh, I've seen people have gouache painting sketchbooks. Yes, I know. I thought, oh my God. Ron Lemon was the one that made an impression on me. He had a gouache painting sketchbook where he would go out plain air painting in gouache and he'd uh -huh. do these like tiny paintings like this big, like like four by three inches or something yeah. and it'd be so perfect because yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's, and maybe now if I look at him, they'd be like, oh, cool. Yeah, those are sketches. But to me back then, I was like a total beginner. I was like, what? That's a sketch from real life. <laughs> yes. And have you seen Steve Houston's sketchbooks? Figurative watercolors? Holy crap. I still look at that stuff and I'm like, that is just pure genius. I, I don't know how he could do that. <laughs> you know, like, uh. <laughs> Now we're moving though again, when you mention Aaron Blaze and Ron Lemon and Steve Houston, yes. we're moving again to the uh, a sketchbook as an art form that is can be so developed. Yes. See- to anyone who's not at their level, yeah, their sketchbooks look like showcase books, right? Because every sketch is so awesome, yeah. But to them, it's not. That's the level 
of exploration and yeah, studying yeah. I, that they're I, I at. got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where the that that comes from, where it's this like fear of messing up because we tend to look at sketchbooks, artists with sketchbooks who we admire, right? We're mm-hmm. not going to look at people's sketchbooks that we think are ugly, mm-hmm. right? And so when we look at those sketchbooks, we then try to do that same thing. And instead of trying to match their mentality and freedom, we're trying to match their quality level, which is mm-hmm. the wrong thing to match. Exactly. Uh, the beginner is, is intimidated by those and may have a false expectation. So, Andrew, tell me about your new Proco course. Oh, well, I appreciate that question coming from a completely objective third-party outsider with absolutely no personal interest in the matter. The new figure sculpting fundamentals course is basically like the figure drawing fundamentals course, but if you are wearing 3D glasses. Wow, that sounds amazing. The figure drawing course is one of the best courses ever. Yes, yes, exactly. The new sculpting course could be described the same way. I wanted to make the course that I wish I had when I first started sculpting. So your students who love figure drawing, they might want to try figure sculpting. It takes drawing to a whole new dimension. And I mean that literally. All right, well, I'll let students know about the new sculpting course available at proco.com slash sculpture and the new Proco 3D YouTube channel. Awesome. Thanks, Stanley. Uh, it's Stan. Mm, are you sure? I thought it was Stanley. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. So you love tone paper, and it's that Strathmore. They have the warm tone and the cool tone, and they, it's a 400 series. Yeah, they have a gray. They have a, a recycled brown type of thing. They have yeah. white. And you like that paper. I do like that paper. I also i have been getting into more smooth paper for, for ink. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I used to not do much ink at all. I, I, I would do a ballpoint pen. Everyone's like you saw, there was a lot of ballpoint pen in the ones I just showed you. But mm-hmm. um, what's the other one? Just ink pens. <laughs> yeah, where you a dip pen or a steel pen or yes. a quill pen, something like exactly. that. Exactly. Those, I, I, I like to be able to like put it down, smudge it real quick if I, if I want to. Kind of like what Kim Jong-gi does, right? And so, I, I've started exploring a little bit with those. So, you, you could sketch differently with these different types of papers. I have not had any watercolor paper sketchbooks ever. Okay. I probably should have one because whenever I see other people's watercolor sketchbooks, they're just so amazing to me. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, Stan, you know, here's something that's happening during this conversation. When I did that exploration, I kept a sketchbook for about six years uh, and obsessively just cranked through it. In fact, we put it all together. We didn't put all of it together. We put about 80 of those pages together and Fatima Burns made a show of it at Mount Sac where we had a number of my students too, where it was, it was like a sketchbook show. And I could not believe how I put my head into that book and just lived in sketchbooks for several years, then stopped doing it and then went back to it periodically. But right now, you're getting me excited about it, not because of the imagery, but because of the materials. There is something about Hmm. paper and different kinds of paper. Most of those several years, almost all of it was done on Strathmore 400 series, the, uh, the drawing 400. What I didn't like about it is that it was wood pulp, which means it's going to fall apart in time. What I liked about it is that it has a wonderful tooth. So, it was a very good one for being inexpensive and it was just a great surface to work on with almost any medium except for heavy wet medium. Any other, any other materials or, or sketchbooks that you like? No, to be honest, most of my sketchbooks Mm -hmm. have been so focused on just like exploration and thought that to me, the material wasn't that important. I just kind of stuck with this toned and white Strathmore books because they're just so available. Yeah. Um, And I I didn't really, I didn't care too much about the material, to be honest. It was just like, this is a place for me to just throw ideas. I want to tell you about a cheap uh, thing that happened. There was in Big Lots, uh, which people might not know what Big Lots is. It's a store of stuff that can't sell and so they sell it for cheap. They had these, these are not sketchbooks. These are scrapbooks and they are made out of wood pulp paper. And 
So it's throwaway paper and they were only a buck a piece. And so I bought about 15 of them. This is one portion of the stack. And it's cards, it was cardstock paper. So it was heavy enough to take pen and ink. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that it was cheap meant that I went at it. And beca because there was a stack there, I thought, you, you, you don't have to scrimp and you've got several more to fill before you call this done. And even though the paper in some way sucked, it's wood pulp, it pulls apart. There was another way in which when you work with something long enough, you start to know it well enough yeah. to enjoy it and embrace the fact that it absorbs ink inconsistently. <laughs> that there's something about like having a musical instrument that you can't, you can't actually predict. Uh, I've done that with, there was a point where the college bookstore was selling uh, rollerball refills, the kind of things that in a rollerball uh, that they're, they're this big and if you put them in your pocket, nobody knows you've got them in your pocket and they had a hundred of them for five cents a piece and I thought, well, what the heck? And so, I just bought all hundred of them <laughs> and in one way, they were awful but in another way, you just get to where you say, this is an old friend and I know how to deal with it. And I kind of wish that I had not spent several years with those roller balls because it's like finding a junkyard full of washboards. So, you decide to take up washboards as your musical instrument instead yeah. of using a, a better instrument. But there, there is something to be said that exploring with different papers and different instruments with low risk is fun. I'm feeling right now like I want to go back on a wave of sketchbooks. But the reason that I did, I got really excited at one point when the sketchbooks were starting to turn into pages that I liked. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to make a living where one once a week you fill up a sketchbook with the most interesting things you can, or fill up a page with the most interesting things. But there was no way to make a living at it. So I just eventually had to change my energy. Yeah. One other thing I found. Because sketchbooks were were all over the place and unfinished, is that I found a paper that I love called Stonehenge, mm -hmm. and it comes in all different kinds. And it's just it's I can talk about it for a long time, but I won't. I'll just say I love Stonehenge paper, and so I bought tons of it and cut it up into eight and a half by eleven or, or uh, A four ish size, and put them in a binder or would just carry loose leaves with me. And that way, I would always have that good paper with me. I could work on it and then just save the ones that are best. So, I, I kind of have gone toward loose leaf for convenience. Yeah. What are you doing right now? What are you doing right now for a sketchbook? Right now? I have, like I said, I have a lot of sketchbooks all the time. They're all themed differently. They have, I, I, have, I enter each one with a different mindset. Okay. It's kind of like, you know how you have, um, dedicated spaces to different activities and when you yeah. enter that space your mind changes to that activity immediately the, the environment helps you quickly adapt to that mentality that you need like when i when i walk into the studio i immediately get into like creative mode working on something yeah right whereas when i walk into my kitchen i'm <laughs> i'm not in creative mode i'm just like oh man i gotta nibble on something <laughs> right uh so I have a lot of sketchbooks, but one of them, the one that's lying around here is actually, look at that. Oh. Oh, it's one with your logo wow. on it. Look at that. I actually manufactured a thousand of these. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were going to sell a bunch of them. Um, and then the, uh, all of them arrived uh, right before the pandemic. And so, we, we actually have a thousand sketchbooks in the other room. Wow. <laughs> They're not for sale. I'm not pitching this right now. We're, we might just donate them all to some like, I don't know, like a children's hospital or something. Some I have no cause. idea. Yeah, something. But uh, I have a, basically a, a lifetime worth of these sketchbooks. So, I have two. This one's very, uh, very, very smooth, very white it's for more for inking. And by the way, uh, I don't know if you could see the, this, is, this is the sketch I did for that. Uh, Oh yeah, that sure more detailed is. Nice, one. So nice here's little a, a little study I did from I think it was an Ivan Logan of painting, and I was like, man, I love the way he broke up the values in that. Yeah. And so I kind of did a little study, and then I that helped me figure out some value distributions in mine. 
yeah. the simplicity and the approach he took helped me to to approach mine. It, it, it's totally different, but it helped me get into that mindset of like yeah. separating values in these ways. Um, and then I got that. And then from there, I actually I did a bunch more. It's not just one, but I took it digitally from here on out to make adjustments and, and go off of different branches from that. I can see uh, it. I can see one great big dark puzzle piece or maybe two dark puzzle pieces that take up a lot of the composition. You did. Right. You picked up the vibe. Yeah. And then like the next page is little, it's like a web design. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just me exploring like profile pages. Um, so like this sketchbook I have on my desk is whatever's on my mind. I don't care. I'm not trying to present this. Like another page is just like some words. I don't, I'm not even sure what it says. It's like some videos that we're working on. So yeah. it's literally like scrap paper, I, not for presenting. Um, and I have so many of these, I don't care about <laughs> ruining them. You sure don't. You want some? They look a lot like the ones you just showed, except these are really high quality. Are they nine by 12? Uh, yes. What am I using now? I'm, oh, I'm using a Strathmore, uh, Strathmore 400 series drawing, but this is the, the white one. It's 9 by 12. It's a little, a little bit bigger than I like. Uh, these smaller ones that are this size are nice because they were easier to carry around, but I'm not ever carrying anything around anymore. Yeah. Yeah, the small ones are nice. Yeah, so these ones, but I'm, the way I'm doing these is that I'll spend a month on one page. It's just something that oh, is cool. sitting around. And because it's sitting around, it's like if I get an impulse to draw, I'll go over there, you know, or I'll have it handy so that it's I'm not even sure what's on these pages because I can't see what you can see. But yeah. Uh, these are, they're big enough to where, and it's quality enough paper to where I don't want to, uh, I don't want to just mess around on it. Hmm. I want it to be something that if I'm going to spend five minutes or 20 minutes on this, I want it to be something nice. One thing I noticed as we're showing our sketchbooks is that all of the sketchbooks we've shown so far are, have a ring binder. Right. I have a very high preference for ring binder sketchbooks. Yeah. What about you? <laughs> Well, I do too because they lay flat. Is that what you mean? Not just flat, but I could fold it completely to the other side. So, um, there are some non-ring binder sketchbooks that still lay flat, but they have to lay flat opened, yeah. right? Oh, they, they, yeah. Right? Okay. They, they can lie flat like that, but you can't go like that and then hold on to it um, with only one page showing. I, I know what you mean, yeah. Right? So that that's the great thing about I think ring binders is you can open it to where you're only looking at one side. I feel that way too. That's personally some people might think like who cares but like to me it actually matters quite a bit. Like is if I'm out somewhere like I used to go to the zoo to sketch a lot. It's very uncomfortable to have a sketchbook that can't fold completely, you know, 180 or no that, that would be 360. Um because you have to hold on to the whole thing versus half of a thing. Yeah. You got to put it under, like inside your elbow. It matters a lot. <laughs> so, one of the main reasons why sketchbooks, as opposed to just loose leaf paper, is that you carry it with you like you're reading a book and it's convenient. Put it in your backpack or your purse or whatever. You have different sizes for, you know, you have one of them in your purse, another one in, in your car that's a little bit bigger. One of them in your painting easel that's maybe only meant for thumbnails before you start painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these sizes can also have different purposes. Yeah, you know, one thing about the years of keeping a sketchbook, I don't get bored anyway if I have something to entertain myself, but I was never bored during those years of keeping a sketchbook because if I had to wait at the auto mechanics or the doctor's office or whatever else, I had a little world I could go into. And, uh, and then some of those things, uh, taking my son to Little League practice, I would sit and watch them play and do little drawings of kids running around. So, it was there was opportunities always with a sketchbook, you can keep yourself entertained. <laughs> what do you think about the social, the social aspect of that? When you go okay. out and you start sketching, that's basically an invitation to everybody to come talk to you. <laughs> 
right? Well, that opens up a whole other topic. Yeah, well, I, kind of. It's, it's, it's a topic about sketching in public. It's very related. I come from a family of arguers. When I started keeping a sketchbook, I spent at least five years bowing out of the conversations at family gatherings and listening while I sketched. And there was a time about a few years into it where I had a dream that I was flying on a magic carpet trying to get home and beneath me, the streets were filled with gang warfare, specific intersections, specific <laughs> neighborhoods that were filled with gang warfare. But it was at night and they didn't see me up there on the flying carpet, so I was never a target. And then I looked at this flying carpet and it was my sketchbook wow. in vivid, vivid detail, all amplified and as big as a giant bed. And I felt good about that dream because it was a way of getting above the political arguments of gang warfare in the family. That's uh, a cool dream. <laughs> yeah. It was, it, was, uh, it was important to me to recognize that this is a way <laughs> previous to that. I had had impulses during family gatherings when they were in backyards. I had impulses to climb trees and it was almost irresistible. And I thought, why? Why? It was because I'm trying to get up above over all, all of this conversation. And mm -hmm. so, the sketchbook was, was with that. But here's where it didn't go so well. Uh, it was an introvert's escape hatch. It was bowing out of the conversation. Yes, it did start some conversations in public, but it didn't tend to start conversations with people that I knew. And so, it was a way of, of safety to be pulling out of that conversation and not get sucked up into that. Uh, and there is, there is a lifestyle to sketchbooks. If you keep a sketchbook and you use it a lot, uh, it, is, it is almost guaranteed to leave you out of the mainstream in some ways until you find another stream of people who are sketchbook enthusiasts who are okay with it. Yeah, that's an interesting dynamic, huh? It's like two opposite things that you actually want. Like if, if, if I'm sketching at home or, or like at a family party or whatever, I don't mind if people come up and talk to me, but mm -hmm. my family would probably tend to be more respectful and be like, oh, he's busy and stay out. Whereas if I'm in public sketching, I kind of don't want people coming up talking to me. Yeah. But those are the people that end up do. It's the people that are like, oh, there's this artist performing on the sidewalk <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go see what he's performing. Yeah. There's pluses and minuses. If it, it can be a great icebreaker in public if you want the ice broken. But I know of some artists who just do not want the ice broken. They want to be alone in yeah. public. You know what I did? Uh, and this, I, I did this accidentally, but then I kind of started liking it. Um, I, I would go to the zoo a lot and, just, and sketch the animals. Um, and one, one day I got headphones like this, where it's over the ear, right? Large headphones. It's obvious that I'm listening to something, not uh -huh. like not little earbuds that you can't see. And I'd be listening to music. I did it purely because I wanted to listen to music while sketching. But I noticed people stopped talking to me because they know I can't hear them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a defense mechanism. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, this is a double positive. I get to listen to music and zone out. And I don't have, I, I can't hear the conversations next to me. And, and people aren't talking to me and distracting me. I can't remember which writer uh, introduced a character, a woman in a book who wore perfume not to attract, but to repel, which yeah. was kind of a new concept to me. But that's the idea is that it is a signal that do not approach me. Yeah. But no, the thing is like, I would then be able to choose one to take off my headphones. So now I was back in control. So if a child walked <laughs> up and a child started watching me, I would take my headphones off. Uh-huh. And, and keep drawing just in case the, the, the child asks me something because that I think I, I'm going to talk to that kid, <laughs> you know, if the kid wants to talk to me. Um, so, now I'm in control. I can choose who I want to talk to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the difference between the do not disturb sign and the come in for coffee. Exactly. Sign. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little, little <laughs> pro tip. <laughs> Some people put wear shirts. Have you heard of that? No. Where it's a shirt and on the back. 
it's all the answers to the most common questions that people <laughs> ask you when they come up to you. <laughs> yes, I am drawing. <laughs> yes. yes, I am an artist. <laughs> yes, I am an artist. <laughs> no, I can't draw Mickey Mouse for you. Mickey Mouse, no. I don't, uh, what was it? Um, I think it was actually kind of a smart ass uh, approach to it. It wasn't actually trying to be useful at answering questions. It would be like, I don't care that you can only draw a stick figure or that you can't draw a stick figure. <laughs> Common one. I don't care that your uncle is an artist too. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, perfume to repel. Yeah. Do you have anything else in your notes that we should cover? Uh, there is one thing, and that is that there does tend to be a sense of guilt trip that goes on to people that are not keeping sketchbooks. Ah, yeah, good point. I felt it for a long time, and every time I tried to start a sketchbook out of guilt, it didn't take. Yeah, no, that's bad. Um, I feel like there are other ways of doing the thing that the sketchbook provides mm -hmm. that people might actually be doing that they don't realize is the same thing as a sketchbook. You know, Tell like, us. well, for example, I think I already mentioned like the newsprint pad, the 18 by 24 newsprint pads that I had when I brought to life drawing sessions mm -hmm. in class. Th those are sketchbooks. Yeah. They're life drawing sketchbooks. Sketch pads. They, they right. are, but people don't think of those. This is my sketchbook. I don't think. They're they're called mm -hmm. they're called pad news pads. It's cause, yeah, because they're so big. Yeah, they're big. But I mean, you could have large sketchbooks. <laughs> and man, the sketches we did in them, like if you're doing quick sketch, it's it's literally called quick sketch. Um, yeah. They're like they're little one. They're little ones that fit on. They would fit on a nine by twelve page as well. So it doesn't matter how big the page is. It's about the drawings. You could do 20, 20 drawings on one page instead of five. Um, so that and then also if you're a digital artist. And you're 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 mostly drawing on your iPad or something. That's the same as a sketchbook. Yeah, like you don't need to literally have a sketchbook. You just need to be. You just need to have an area, a way where you are failing fast. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. my that's my whole thing. Is like the sketchbook is to explore ideas and to to have freedom to mess up. Yeah, you need somewhere that you're doing that. Because you don't have that freedom on a, on a piece that you now take and, and you start taking seriously. Like if you stretch canvas over a thick stretcher bar and this canvas that you bought is nice linen, you're not going to sketch on it. You're going you're gonna to try to make the best possible painting. Um, and you need a place where you can prepare for that and explore and mess up before you go and, and spend all this money on, on these expensive materials. Yeah. And the whole thing about a book is that it is not locked down to one place in the studio where you're doing that work. This is portable, mm -hmm. and so you do have the option of, 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 of a varied environment. The guilt trip thing, it might be that the best way is to give yourself permission not to keep a sketchbook until you, like I did in my late 30s, recognize I need to get past something. I need an arena where I can do this. And uh, if you find a metaphor, that has emotional meaning to you. That flying carpet was not a metaphor that I chose. It was given to me in a dream. But you could make a list of ways to see it. Uh, it could be a piggy bank. You see the sketchbook as a piggy bank that every time I fill up a page, I'm making an investment in my future drawing skills. Uh, we mentioned the thing about the introvert's escape hatch. Uh, another way to look at a sketchbook would be to look at it as a garden. You get to arrange your own garden uh, or even a theater with 50 stages in it because you figure if you've got 50 stages, you can improvise 50 sketches on those stages like comedy sketches. But I think one, one of the ones that came to my mind when we were talking was uh, the love of certain papers is to see it as a playground. Uh, that might be one of the most enjoyable ones is that it's not a guilt trip to go out on the playground. It's that you get to go out on the playground. Yeah, it should be fun. If you're not having fun sketching in your sketchbook or in your iPad or whatever, you're probably missing the point and you need to reevaluate, I think, right? <laughs> uh, or yeah, I, I mean, some people get great work done out of guilt. 
Uh, and so at least the guilt did that good job. <laughs> That's it, it, true. It, you, were, you were achieving. But I think there's a long term, I can't wait to not ever have to do this again yeah. when we're motivated primarily by guilt. Yeah, this should be a lifetime habit, I think. Oh, another very encouraging thing. This the, One of the most prosaic ways to look at a sketchbook would be, rather than as a playground, as documentation of your growth. Yeah. Like when a kid grows and you put little marks on the on the wall to show how high they were at a certain age. Uh, it's not that poetic of a way to look at it, but it's if after a year or two of investing in a sketchbook, you look at your growth, it can be really exciting to see how many lines you used to use and how within a year by practicing, you've You've used fewer and better lines to make the same point. There's all sorts of things like that that can be encouraging. Yeah. It's proof of growth. And I think it changes our mindset to where I can grow. I know it. So, I've got more, more to come. Yeah. And with that, actually, my suggestion is every once in a while, put a, a year or a date, you know, in a corner of one of the pages because it will be very helpful when you're looking back to your you know, dozens of sketchbooks and you'll be able to sort them in order and it's kind of oh, nice yeah. to be able to do that. When you have you know, a stack of 20 sketchbooks and you actually don't know what order they were, it, there's something about it that makes me go, ah, yeah, yeah. I wish I knew when each one was <laughs> what year. Yeah. I mean, I can kind of take a guess by looking at the quality and be like, oh, I remember. And there'd be a page in there where I was working on some project and I'd be like, oh, okay, that project was this year. So, I know that was back then, you know, yes. so I could get these clues. But yeah. if you just put a year, <laughs> as a, not every page, not every page, but like- But often enough, as habit put the year or even the month, if you're doing a lot of pages, just a few uh, digits, right? Twenty uh, zero three two eight two one. Yeah, yeah. Right. That is something that not to neglect because you can't do it. You think you can do it later because right now is so vivid. I'll always remember I did it right now. But putting the date in. And one other thing, if it's a sketchbook that you value, put your put your information on it so that if if you leave it more than once. I have uh -huh. left my sketchbook. I have forgotten my sketchbook because of for whatever reason at a museum and I got a call on my cell phone uh, and I, it spared Ooh. me the trouble that it would have been uh, because somebody let me know, we got your sketchbook and you might make a new friend or they might steal it. Yeah. Future Marshall here. I wanted to add something about sketchbooks that it didn't occur to me when we recorded the official episode but it I've thought of it since and I think this has value. If you're new to a sketchbook, consider making your first sketchbook about what you'll do with a sketchbook. This would include scribblings around and mess makings, almost like Rorschach tests that you can later look at and assess. So, you've got pages where you draw and there are no rules, then you get away from it and then come back and make notes about what you did. It's like turning a kid loose on a playground and letting them do anything they want to do. And then the therapist comes out and watches what they do and, and assesses, uh, makes a profile of what this kid is like. So, you get to be the kid on the playground and you also do your own self-therapy. Uh, and one of the good things about this one sketchbook devoted to what I want to do with a sketchbook is that if you get really excited about it segueing into something else, you can drop it and move on to another sketchbook. Or if you get excited about continuing in the sketchbook, that's fine too. But I would recommend that you make it a pretty high quality one so that you will not be tempted to throw it away like embarrassing baby pictures. If it does its job and you move on to another sketchbook, you shelve it like a booster rocket that got you into orbit, but you want to save the booster rocket in case you want it to propel you into another orbit later. You can treat it as a sacred text, not the final word, but important nonetheless because it has a profound impact on your time, your energy, your style, your subject matter, your everything about drawing. 
It means you take it seriously because you've got this time pulled away from it to see what it is you're doing, to make your plan. It's different from a whiteboard because a whiteboard, even though it's a conversation with yourself, is vertical and it's more like a conversation in a room where other people can hear. The sketchbook is more like a diary. It's more intimate. It's more what you tell yourself without self-consciousness. So it's fulfilling a different function from a whiteboard. It's more like paying attention to your dreams, the quiet internal things. The whiteboard is more like designing a public image. Uh, it's more like a billboard in a way. The sketchbook is different. It goes to sleep at night and the petri dish metaphor may be a better one. If you see it as a garden and you put little seeds of ideas in it, uh, sometimes when you revisit it later, you may be astonished at how it planted seeds in your artistic development. I've had that happen. Anyway, all this is something I didn't think of when we were talking, but it may be helpful to you if you're new to sketchbooks. When my friend John told me that he was excited Draftsman was being sponsored by Mint Mobile, I asked him why. Well, he's already been using Mint Mobile for over a year now, and he's been saving a ton of money by bundling his service plan. He's been able to do that because rather than paying for extra data he doesn't use, he's picked a plan that perfectly fits his data usage needs. And this smarter wireless company offers plans starting as low as $15 a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash draftsman. That's mintmobile.com slash draftsman. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash draftsman. Well, I hope this was helpful for you. And if nothing else, instead of having a sketchbook out of guilt, have it out of the joy of what you're going to do in there. Yeah. Thanks, Stan. And also, get a freaking sketchbook. Yeah. <laughs> Stan will put the trip on you. He'll play yeah. the bad cop. If you don't, I'm going to cancel your Proco account. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Starting to draw the battle lines over the sketchbook. I'm going to ban you from my YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm going to talk to your girlfriend. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, guys. Don't worry. I'm not going to take your girlfriend. You don't have to scare. <laughs> And I'm sure not. <laughs> I'm not even a threat. <laughs> All right. Anyway, okay. it was fun. Thanks, All Marshall. Right. I'll see you next week. Good seeing you. Bye. See you, Stan.